Welcome back to Extra Dirt, the podcast designed to help you in your life group put down deeper roots relationally and spiritually. You know, as we look through uh, Luke a little bit more this week, we see Jesus here at work actually casting out demons, overcoming the work of Satan and the world, and this question arises, who is Jesus? And more importantly, perhaps, arises the question of where do you stand in terms of, of who Jesus is? Are you in Christ? Because the reality is we want you to understand that at the, at the base of this is this struggle really for the souls of people, for the eternal life of people. That's why ministering just to physical needs of someone without actually sharing the gospel could actually be doing them a disservice. Very often it's the painful, uncomfortable things in our lives that drive us towards God. And if we're to alleviate that to such a point where somebody no longer seeks after God, then we might have actually hurt them. Um, the goal is not to stop helping them, though. The goal is to, to love them and to serve them with God's love while also bringing with them, with you, um, the most important thing, the eternal reality of the gospel and the importance of the blood of Christ. We look at what Jesus did, and Jesus' argument sort of um, rises and falls on, on the facts of his life, on what he's doing. And I think we can apply that very much to our own lives as well. And this is why I wanted you to look at, at 1 John 5 as this additional, um, this additional passage of Scripture to look at. Because here we're told that Jesus is born of, of water and of blood. I think this probably refers to the fact that Jesus is baptized, that he um, is in, in agreement with this ministry that says it is in repentance that we find God's forgiveness. It's not in um, us earning our salvation, but it's in repentance. And then also in blood, again, the sacrifice, the shedding of his blood on the cross, obviously, is what pays our penalty and allows us to have access to God. So then we also identify with Christ, and we testify that we are in Christ when we partake in baptism, when we are baptized, when we are born of water, if you will. There's nothing mystical or magical about it, except to say, you know, I, I affirm, I proclaim that I am indeed in Christ. And we also do that again when we remember Christ with the Lord's Supper, when we remember, remember with the blood, um, we are also testifying, yes, that I am in Christ, and I depend on him for my salvation. But sort of the key focal point here is, is you'll notice that the testimony that John says is definitive about Jesus is not what Jesus himself necessarily does, but what God says about him, what the Spirit testifies to him. So it's God's work um, at play being, being acted out in Jesus' life that really affirms and testifies to who he is. And we look at ourselves in that same way then. If I am indeed in Christ, and I have the Spirit, and the Spirit changes me, then my actions will natu naturally reflect that. And so, do I have the testimony of, of water and of blood? Have I been baptized? Am I taking communion? But perhaps most importantly, is the Spirit actually transforming me, or am I no different than I was before I was in Christ? Because, the, again, the important reality is that God changes us, God transforms us. And we do these other things as a testimony, not to be saved, but just as outward indicators, if you will, um, of a reality that has taken place on the inside. And so that's why we encourage you as, we, as we're looking this to keep in, in your mind the idea that the important thing in this whole conflict is not just that people would feel good, not that their life would get cleaned up for a little bit so that they wouldn't suffer so much, but that their life would be cleaned up by the Holy Spirit and filled with the Holy Spirit in order to, to keep what is evil and sinful and wrong of the world and that's in our flesh from filling that space back up and making it worse than before. And it is only in God's authority, it is only in the authority and the power of Jesus Christ that that can actually permanently happen. So again, we, we encourage you, um, realize that, that the Christian walk is not just about being a better person, it's about allowing God to transform us, to clean the junk out of our lives, to fill ourselves up with him so that the Spirit at work in us testifies that we are followers of Christ, just as Jesus was able to say, look, I cast out demons, that proves that I am of God, because uh, Satan cannot be against himself, basically. So we have this idea of testimony. Um, I would encourage you just sort of in passing, try not to get too wrapped up in, in the water and the blood significance other than to say, look, if, if you haven't testified to your following Christ in these things, he's told us to remember him um, in, in communion and to identify with him in baptism. So if you haven't done that, be obedient. Uh, but the most important thing is, what is the spirit at work in you testifying to you?
people look at you, can they tell um, that you're a Christian? Or perhaps <laughs> when they look at you, do they not assume that you're just as um, sinful as the whole rest of the world, that there's something different about you because the Spirit is at work inside you? In terms of more uh, practical considerations on how to navigate some of the dynamics in your group, you may find somebody who talks a lot. And typically, um, this might be me in the group, uh, you probably know, as I say that, who it is. Who in your group is always answering the questions, is always talking, or, or tends to rabbit trail, or go this way or that way, and chase things, and, and really distract from people, and, and make your time to be unproductive. If you can identify that person, and pull them aside, and just lovingly say, hey, look, <laughs> I appreciate your engagement, I appreciate the way you're doing this, but when you uh, take these rabbit trails, it really prevents us from understanding and going deeper into the material that we're studying. And so let's make up a, a, a sign, if you will. I, I heard of a lady who said they made just like this bunny, this bunny ears sign to signify he's taken a rabbit trail. And so somebody in their group, whenever they started going on, it, it started out as sort of this secret hand signal like bunny ears, um, hey, you're, uh, whenever the guy would go, he, she'd do this and he'd laugh and, and know to just kind of shut his mouth and get back on track. Eventually the group found out about it and it became a, a big inside joke and something that drew their group together even better. But I'd encourage you to find some subtle way in which you can remind this person not to um, take the group in a totally different direction. And by doing so, um, sort of surreptitiously, you avoid the stigma that comes with you shutting someone down talking. Because it's very hard, especially in a group that isn't super comfortable, um, if you tell somebody, all right, that's enough, <laughs> let's move on, um, that can sort of discourage uh, participation by other people who don't feel as comfortable sharing. So do if, if you need to, if you've got somebody who just keeps taking the group elsewhere, elsewhere um, come up with a, a subtle, you know, baseball sign or something that you can use to communicate to them without breaking up the whole group like hey let's let's rein it back let's get back on track um if if you have a group that where you're close enough that you can just flat out say like whoa where are you going with this that's awesome that's great but typically um once you get to that point you're not listening to me uh, explain to you how to fix those sort of things because you already just do it so at any rate um we hope that's helpful for you and we will see you again here back next week. Take care and God bless.